So, ladies and gentlemen, my great pleasure to be able to welcome David Shepherd. Give him a big welcome, please. Thank you. Well, that's absolutely right. Yes, it's a real privilege to come and speak to you because uh, my association with Friends of King Alfred Buses goes back um, for longer than I can actually remember. Um, it's been part of my life and I'm sure we have shared associations and shared memories that we will relive um, during the next few moments. What I'm going to do tonight is to do something that's a bit different uh, for bus preservationists. I think bus preservationists have a natural love of the past and trying to recreate the past in the present and keep things going. What I think traditionally we're less good at doing and less willing to do perhaps is to think about the future. And I think that comes quite hard to us. And I think we are in a situation now where the preservation movement is facing lots of challenges that will require us to do exactly that. So I'm gonna try and bridge a gap between the two things and do the bit that we love and talk about um, the past in preservation terms, in terms of the buses we love, um, and a little bit about the challenges we're facing and how we might deal with those in the future to give this lovely, wonderful hobby that we have and the passion that we have, the future that it deserves and that future generations deserve as well to have the opportunity to enjoy the, the fruits of our labor. Now, before I do any of that, is just give uh, anyone who wants to leave the opportunity because um, they might have come along tonight to hear a talk on how to paint an elephant in the wild or even how to start the Bluebell Railway and preserve 9F locomotive Black Prince and uh, keep it going. Well, I'm afraid I'm not that David Shepherd. So if that's why you're here, now is your moment. And equally, if you're here to hear a sermon from the Bishop of Liverpool, or indeed punditry on cricket, the great cricket umpire, I'm afraid I'm not qualified so to do. Interestingly enough, I do have the dubious honor of having announced the sad passing of uh, the late Bishop of uh, Liverpool. Uh, on the six o'clock news on the BBC one morning, um, I had to deliver this news as the top story, very big figure in history, very well known. And the opening to the BBC news that morning went something like, BBC news at six o'clock, this is David Shepherd. David Shepherd has died. <laughs> And there are some things in our lives that we will never forget. And for me and anybody who heard it, that's one of them. So I'm not he, but uh, you will deduce from that that um, I'm David Shepherd, who has been a, a broadcaster for 20 odd years. And more importantly, in this context, a preservationist for 35 years. Um, I was seven years old when I first got my hands dirty on an old bus. Um, it was actually, the, the getting the hands dirty bit wasn't the bit that I remember. It was getting a, a Stanley scraper blade in my lip, which was the, the, within the first week. So it's a wonder that I didn't get put off. And uh, these days, in fact, for 10 years, I've been a trustee of the Thames Valley and Great Western Omnibus Trust. And we've worked together a, a lot over the years. Um, so our organizations are, are good friends. And um, as you know, being a trustee, a lot of people in the room will know this. It's all about just standing around and eating ice cream. So uh, that's what we do. But alongside my arduous duties as a, an ice cream eating trustee, I also get involved with um, working on the vehicles. I look really happy about that. Um, driving the vehicles. In fact, I will be driving the LWL that you see here at the South Devon Railway tomorrow and um, working on the vehicles when they break down. I think that's caught my best side, don't you? 
And at the moment, I'm working on a project uh, for the National Association of Road Transport Museums, which I'll be telling you about a little bit later when we start to look at the future of the preservation movement and where it might go. And part of that is a media campaign called the Bus Inspectors. And you'll, uh, you'll be fully briefed in that department. First, I'd like to take you on a little journey. And as we're on the patch, you've got a Hanson Dorset ticket there. It's already been used, actually, hasn't it? But uh, well, we, we'll do it. We'll do it that way. That's your ticket for tonight's journey, which is going to take us thence and hence. So we're going back to um, the first 35 years of my preservation career and using that as a lens to look at a lot of the work that you've been doing and things that you will remember. And then we're going to go forward into the future and look at how this project I'm working on might help to give that the future that it deserves. I'm gonna take you right back to where it all started for me. Um, Hot Chocolate sang a song, it started with a kiss. For me, it didn't. It started with a fart. Because what four-year-old boy doesn't love a fart sound? And one morning, I remember very clearly walking down the stairs and my sister said to me, come and have a look at this on the television. There's a baby that's just farted. And it so happened that uh, we'd recorded a film that, that had been on the television, repeated on the television the night before, and in it was the most tremendous fart sound. And so we rewound it as you could do on VHS and we watched it again and we laughed our socks off until we nearly erupted ourselves. And then we let the video carry on to see the rest of the film, which was this, Mutiny on the Buses. You know the scene now. And very quickly, the people in it became my somewhat unlikely heroes. Uh, for a four-year-old boy growing up in the 80s to have Stan Butler and Jack Harper and Blakey as uh, my heroes was quite unusual. But nonetheless, on the buses was the thing that would be on in the house every day. And uh, woe betide any bad behavior, the threat that would... Uh, cajole me back to a life of goodness would be no on the buses for the week if you carry on doing that. And it worked. And I think what I really loved about watching it is that it was a grown-up world. All the toys I liked weren't the ones that were made for children. They were the ones that looked like they were made for adults. I liked the lorries that had real logos on the side of them rather than made up ones. And this world was a real world and I felt like I was part of this. And this opening scene made me want a set right ticket machine more than anything I've ever wanted before. Now, the fact that these were my heroes was very popular with my dad because he loved on the buses and he had a childhood interest in buses that all of this rekindled. My mother, on the other hand, was very worried about what this might turn into as an adult. I mean, little did she know. Um, but that scene in particular, I remember her explaining to me that Jack Harper, having just taken all the money from the passengers, was going into that shop to book a holiday. <laughs> At which point I said, well, I'm not sure about that, Mum, because I didn't know Ladbrokes did holidays as well as horses. So you, you can't kid a kid. Um, so this world really was absorbing for me. And one of the things that very quickly became an attraction was, of course, the buses. Um, in this case, a former Eastern National KSW. Uh, there was one Westcliff-on-Sea KSW in it as well. Um, in Holiday on the Buses, you see United Counties KSW. We don't talk about that because that does a lot of damage. But um, it came to be that I really wanted a, a Bristol KSW. And despite the fact that this, my first bus looks like an RT, 
To me, that is a Bristol KSW, and I won't hear anything else about it. So my very first bus, there it is. Um, once I got the bus, the thing I really wanted was a Sam Butler hat. And of course, as I've mentioned, I wanted a Jack Harper ticket machine. So the full kit was starting to emerge in my mind. And uh, by the way, I was still four at this point. Now, dreams come true two days before my fifth birthday. Uh, Chiswick Works, London Transport Chiswick Works was about to close. And we got wind of this and at the Commercial Motor Show, um, my dad, who for many years was the fleet engineer for John Lewis uh, Partnership and Waitrose, um, made contact with somebody who was exhibiting there and said, could I come for a look round? Little did we know that it would be a bit more than a look round. We would be uh, among the very last people to be taken around the skid pan. And sure enough, I was hoist into the cab of... RM 1921, and I remember this as if it were yesterday. Isn't it an odd thing with time that it, um, it never feels like the number? Uh, the instructor's name was Leslie Grahams. I remember him telling me that, and I remember the next question he asked me was, did I think I was strong enough to turn the steering wheel? Well, I thought he meant while the bus was stationary, but little did I realize we were about to leap into action and off we went with Mr. Graham's working the pedals and the gears. And if we zoom in a bit, we'll see. He's definitely got no hands on that steering wheel, has he? And the other thing I remember about this is saying to him, well, the, the handbrake's on the wrong side and it's because I'd watch them in on the buses and it's over there on a KSW and it's there on a Route Master. So two days before my fifth birthday, I drove my first bus. And there's a certificate to prove it. When I think back to this, I think that can't really have happened, but they even gave me a little certificate to prove it. And they gave me something else while I was there. They gave me a brown paper bag in the stores. And bearing in mind, this was about to close. And they said, you can have this, but you must never, ever tell anybody where you got it. And you mustn't wear it until you get home. And it was a hat. It was a London Transport hat. And of course, straight in the car, straight on the head, as we went through the security gates. <laughs> look at me. Look at what they've given me. Look at what but they just led us out as quickly as we could go. And by the way, this hat is still with me, and here I am as recently as last night um, with it at the London Transport Museum. And it's really tiny. Why they had such a tiny hat in stock, I don't know, but um, it was meant to be. So gradually I'd assembled this kit of parts. I, I had a set right ticket machine, my first one, uh, which came from somebody in Wales who used to uh, refurbish them. And I was very upset that the handle didn't wind backwards, so I couldn't get the tickets back in. So we had the, the hat and the ticket machine. There was only really one thing left to get, wasn't there? Um, and therefore, we started going low-decker hunting. And bearing in mind I grew up in the early 80s, most low-deckers had long since been withdrawn from service. There were, though, still a couple to be found if you knew where to look. And the Isle of Wight was very fertile ground for this. Southern Vectis had some open top LDs that they kept on and um, were also in the process of assembling a vintage fleet where they would buy a lot of vehicles ba uh, back that they had sold on and um, started to paint them uh, back into their original liveries. And um, we... Uh, we had a discussion about, wouldn't it be lovely to buy a low-decker? <laughs> um, which was a theoretical thing at the time. And then this happened. We went to our first bus rally, which was uh, the, I think, the 1986 or 1987 uh, Bristol rally at Hengrove. 
And we caught the train there, and there was to be a shuttle bus. And we assumed it would be a, a fairly unappetizing modern bus, but it actually turned out to be um, GAE 883D, which was the last FLF in service uh, with Bristol Omnibus. And it had just been repainted into Tilling Green. And this is um, Brian Dimmock, is the, the man we see by the cab door. He was Bristol's last conductor. And he had his little dog with him there who used to go out with him on the bus. And this was the first green FLF I ever saw and rode on. And at that point, uh, it, it became an idea that had some legs, I think, at least in the mind of uh, a six-year-old. Uh, but we did also see on that rally field other vehicles that were owned by private individuals. So we knew that it, it was something that others did. Um, and I decided that when we bought our Lodeca, it had to be one that had the later style grille because I liked the Lodeca badge. So a specification was being built here. It had to be a green one as well, and it had to have cave brown cave heating because um, I like the vents for those. So we did some serious uh, thinking about this, and um, the hunting went from trying to get rides on low deckers to trying to find somebody who had one that they would part with. And it was really difficult to find at the time because there was a uh, an export market for low bridge uh, buses, which meant that more or less as soon as a half cab low bridge vehicle came on the market, it would be snapped up. So uh, whilst adverts like this would appear in Buses magazine each month, very often you'd ring the number and the vehicle would be sold. And in this instance, in uh, mid-1989, a call was made to break a omnibus sales and Ted Brakel answered the phone and told my dad that, uh, yes, he did have an FLF at his premises, but a deal had already been done with uh, some Dutch buyers who were going to turn it into a mobile pub. And um, he was expecting the Dutch buyers to come and look at it and sign the, the paperwork the following Saturday afternoon. So we went on Saturday morning and this is what we found. Uh, everything about it was uh, a mess. Uh, and it didn't have a low decker badge, which was the first thing I noticed. It should have a low decker badge. It's got the right grill, but the low decker badge was missing. It had the wrong wheels, which uh, when I was very young, I had an absolute fascination with wheels and allegedly would be able to tell you if the wheels on any car on the street were not the uh, ones that nature intended. And certainly with buses, uh, I would spot that instantly. Uh, it was the wrong color. It didn't have a destination blind. It did have the cave brown cave radiators. Nonetheless, I think we can work with some of these things. And we, decided, I think, at the moment we clapped eyes on it, that this would be the one if we could uh, persuade him to sell it to us. I say us, my dad was putting the money up for it, although I did invest my pocket money. Um, and so we got it and a deal was done where uh, the bus would be given an MOT and it, it was, but it didn't leave the yard to get it. So it had a certificate, but it didn't have basic functions like lights and horns. So we'll, we'll, we'll leave that there. Uh, but we, uh, we left that day having put a deposit on the vehicle at just the point that some Dutch people came the other way up the drive and we sort of waved in passing. And I think they got the Albion Lowlander on the left. Uh, which was a South Knotts Albion Lowlander that Ted Brakel tried to sell to us, and then he would have sold two buses. So we then had this um, incredible wait where we knew that we owned a low decker. We didn't have it, and more importantly, we didn't have anywhere to keep it. What were we going to do with it? Well, that was my dad's issue to try and research. Mine was to try and research the bus and find out all about it. And we discovered very quickly that, of course, 
Um, it was a Hanson Dorset low decker, new in July 1966. Quite incredibly, Viv Carter, who is a very well-known preservationist, happened to be at ECW during the point that um, it was being built. And a few years ago, this incredible photograph of it, yet to be completed, uh, materialized. We couldn't quite believe our eyes. In fact, it's so, it's so new here. Um, it's low decker badge is still wrapped up here. It's still got masking tape on the grill and you can see all the wires going in where the inside is uh, still being fitted out here. So uh, that would be early in 1966 at Lowestoft. And it was numbered 1540. Um, there's a bloke up to something at the front of that. I wonder what that could be. It was based originally at Pool Depot. Now we know what the bloke was doing. Uh, so there it is at Pool being rescued, embarrassingly close to home. And uh, it remained at Pool for most of its working life. Renumbered 1237 in the great renumbering scheme and of course painted poppy red. And it was actually a very early repaint. This is it. Um, you can't really see from this, but uh, I've got the original slide for this. And if you zoom in, you can see that it's a GLJ registered one. And at this stage in its life of the three GLJ registered ones, it was the only one that had short wings um, because the wings on FLFs were uh, very often cut off. You can see here the original um, long wings and then here uh, to improve the airflow and also to rectify accident damage, they used to get cut off. And also ours, um, Hanson Dorset never did a particularly neat job of this and ours, the offside wing was cut off at a slight angle. So that's definitely it. And um, that uh, we think means that it was a, a very early repaint into Poppy Red. Uh, it stayed at Poole until the end of uh, crew operation in 1978 and then moved to Southampton where they carried on uh, for a couple more years. And it had a couple of modifications to the front while it was at Southampton, I think as a result of um, accident damage. So it had a different front cowl put on. And then it was finally withdrawn by Hanson Dorset in 1980. And it went via uh, Martins of Middlewich, who um, had a pretty good record actually at, at selling things on for further use. And it's why they're, are or were so many Hanson Dorset low deckers in Europe, I think, because Martins and Middlewich were um, the principal dealer that um, dealt with the, the disposal for them. But you can see here, Good News Travels had two. They have 1540 and also 1543. Uh, 1543 uh, came out of it worse, I think, really, from a, a preservationist's point of view. It was kitted out with beds and used as a decker home, as others called them. Top Deck Travel did a lot of this sort of thing, and they called them decker homes. And um, that was used a lot abroad for holidays, um, whereas ours was used predominantly for local services in and around Hull. And uh, we're told that they chose to do it that way around because ours had its original four-speed gearbox. Hanson Dorset preferred four-speed gearboxes in uh, their town-based FLF. So as a Poole and Bournemouth vehicle, uh, it was very, very useful to them with a the four-speed. Whereas 1543, which I think towards the end of its life um, was a Fareham-based bus, um, had had a five-speed box put in it. So that's, that's why they chose to do it that way around. And um, 1543 lasted a bit longer with Good News Travels, actually. Ours was disposed of in about 1987 and went through uh, a series of driver training companies, uh, one in Chichester and then another in Wales. And it was lettered up for the one in Wales, but I don't think it ever went there. Uh, instead, it went to Sykes of Barnsley. It was sold for scrap and, believe it or not, was rescued from there by Carl Island, who is the prolific dealer that um, many will know has exported dozens, if not hundreds, of low-deckers. 
ours actually owes its existence in certainly in the UK to Carl Island, um, who bought it but couldn't get the work done on it quickly enough to fulfill his export commitments, so passed it over to Ted Brakel. So indirectly, um, Carl has been responsible for it uh, entering preservation. And that's something he'll tell you very, very proudly if you meet Carl and ask him. So he got his low decker. He got, I don't know how he got his knee patches, but he got his low decker. Uh, he got his ticket machine, he got his hat, he got his low decker. Uh, a very, very lucky boy. And um, he's never forgotten really how, how lucky he's been to, to do all of these things. Uh, it was a mess and it took a, a good deal of work to try and uh, get things to a stage where we could use it. We did eventually find somewhere to keep it. Uh, it was a farm in Arborfield where my dad's work colleague's wife's daughter had a friend. So it was about five removed, I think. And um, we worked on it out in the open there. Uh, as you can see, health and safety hadn't been invented. Um, that's, you might think that's me standing on that ladder. It's actually my dad. And he, he would have been roughly the age that I am now. I'm sure he wouldn't mind me telling you. Um, you can see by the time of the photo on the right that uh, the front blind has been reinstated there. It's actually not glass in there. That's Perspex, which was cut for us by my Uncle Roy, who worked in a Perspex factory. So um, we, uh, we had that delivered to us. And uh, <laughs> um, you'll see that we've corrected the absence of the low decker badge there. Priorities, priorities. We've also got the whiskers back on the, the top of the front cowl, either side of the radiator cap. And we've got the original style grill. Um, there were different types of grills on FLF, some mounted in front of the fiberglass panel, some mounted behind. And we had a mixture of the two that just didn't look right. And actually that was, um, that was Southampton uh, that we have to blame for that. A lot of repaneling was done on it while it was on the farm. I remember the farm with mixed emotions because it was greatly exciting to go and see the bus. But invariably, the smell was unbearable. It was a working farm and uh, working conditions that so it was muddy, it was smelly. If you had to do anything underneath the bus, because I was quite small, I was always the favorite for doing dirty jobs under the bus, but not great on the farm. We did though manage to take it to its first rally on the 16th of June, 1990. And it was the Historic Commercial Vehicle Society Ridgeway Run. And here it is among all the pristine vehicles uh, really looking the part there. Uh, but the, the sense of pride that we had on that occasion, that we had a bus and it was at a rally, um, was quite incredible. And at this rally, we met several people who would go on to become lifelong friends. The Bristol KSW was owned by the late Peter Pribick, who we met for the first time on that day. And the two single-deckers that you see on the left, I think they're Bristol SUs. Um, those, uh, well, the, the red one certainly was at that stage owned by Colin Billington and the green and cream one was owned by uh, a painter and decorator who lived in Shepparton called John Hawkins. And just a, a quick reminiscence about him. If you're involved in working on the vehicles, you'll know that for all the love that you put into them, love and care, they sometimes bite you back unnecessarily. They're like cats, aren't they? They, they absorb the love and then they lash out at you. Um, we remember John Hawkins relining the, the headlining inside his SU coach. And he did a wonderful job of it. It looked absolutely super, got all the right material. He's very, very proud of it and came round and, um, uh, asked us to come in and have a look at it with him. And there he was standing there, very proud of it. That was on the Saturday. And we went back in on the Sunday just to pick up some tools, I think. And the headlining had fallen down like a pair of knickers like this. And um, so we, we tossed a coin to decide who was going to phone up John and tell him. So there it is, the Ridgeway run. And, and this was a real um, seminal moment in the, in the whole thing 
for me, meeting people and realizing that we're not the, not the only people that um, own vehicles. Um, our dear and much missed friend 1557, uh, this was the first time I saw 1557, which was the Hanson Dorset Day in 1990, which was in April. So this would be just before the Ridgeway Run. And we were really at this stage trying to understand Hanson Dorset and get a feel for the routes and the vehicles and what they were like and what the colours should be and um, in particular here, the fleet number plate. Um, this is, I've included this for several reasons actually. This is fairly typical of what we did in these days. There was an unspoken rule between my dad and I that if we wanted a photograph of a bus or details on a bus, I would need to stand in front of it. Because in those days, it was very expensive to take photographs. You had to buy the film. You had to take it to Boots. You had to then go and pick up uh, the photographs. And if my mum went into Boots to pick up these envelopes full of old bus, bus photographs, um, they'd be held to pay. So we had a bit of an understanding that I'd always be in the pictures. So we've got dozens of pictures like this of me and I think in that I think the reason I'm looking so distracted and smiling is because we know what we're doing and it's really the fleet number plate that um, we were trying to capture here because ours didn't have a fleet number plate on it when we got it, it they were removed in 1972 when it was renumbered and of course National Bus had transfers and I'd certainly never seen a Hanson Dorset fleet number plate. My dad had back in the day, but couldn't really remember the details. So like so many things in uh, bus preservation in those days, we had to try and conjure some up from thin air. And I, I actually think now it's become a bit easier to do that conjuring. I don't know whether it's because the air is different um, or whether it's digital air that makes it a bit easier to do this and we've got communication that allows us to see what's out there and to share photographs. But in those days, it was all about doing what you could and trying to copy things that other people had uh, restored and done their best with. And that's very much um, what we had to do with those. So we ended up having some fleet number plates that were made that were based on these, um, only to discover years later that these actually were themselves <laughs> replicas. But anyway, they've done us very well. And I think the likelihood of 1540s um, actual fleet number plate ever coming out of the woodwork is um, very, very unlikely. So who knows? Working on the bus on the farm was one thing. It, it was intolerable. And so we decided that what we would do is bring it home at weekends. And here we are on a housing estate in Twyford in Berkshire. We were very lucky we were on an end plot, so we had quite a long drive. And with the back end of the bus overhanging the grass, we were able to um, do some work on there. We also had some very understanding neighbors. And just to prove that we really were on a housing estate, scraping the paint off the roof of the FLF. There's the view. And of course, the neighbors had a wonderful view back at us. And then eventually we found that there were other uh, premises nearby where uh, preserved vehicles were stored. And this is me with my wheel fascination. And there's the bus. Suddenly, magically, it's undercover and it's all starting to um, take shape fairly quickly. And a rare photograph of uh, the two of us together. This was taken by Colin Billington. And you'll see that we've managed to get the bus in top coat at this stage, ready for its debut at the Hanson Dorset running day in 1991. And a sea of Wilson Dorset vehicles that we can only salivate over now. They really were 10 a penny then. And there we are at Sandbanks, our inaugural running day. I'm the one on the left, by the way. <laughs> and there begins um, this great journey that we've been on ever since. And just briefly to talk about our King Alfred associations, um, I think our first Winchester running day that we attended was 1992, 
January the 1st, 1992. And um, it was back in the days when everything was done by hand. We'd receive a, we'd receive a letter, uh, handwritten from James. Uh, this one requests that we give him a phone message or a fax. And you can see at the top, it's a fax was sent in response to this. And as I say, everything was done by hand. That's um, my hand-drawn way bill for the 1995 um, running day. And I've got all of them, by the way, in, uh, in stock. That was the neatest one. It's the only one I could read. And we were there come shine, snow, all hours of the day and night. Um, some fantastic times we've had. Not only were we there, but we were here. So just literally just outside the, the hall there. And it's such a fast FLF that you don't even see it go past. There it is, so it's, it, it's straight down there. I've put that in just to show that it does have a back as well. Um, I'm gonna romp through a, a, a little bit of this now. Um, I'm just quickly gonna take you to Blackpool Pleasure Beach. We went on a holiday to Scotland in 1992 and we stopped at Blackpool Pleasure Beach. I've got two sisters who were desperate to go there. I don't remember anything about Blackpool Pleasure Beach, but I do remember seeing in the distance a white FLF. And as we approached it, you could see that it was a long uh, FLF, one of the 30 foot long, 31 foot long FLFs, um, just like the ones in On the Buses. In fact, one of the actual ones that was in On the Buses, AVW399F. And uh, this was, I mean, look at the beaming smiles here. This was an extraordinary thing. There it is back in, in the day, a chance encounter like this. The reason I've included this is, again, young bus enthusiasts now only have to look on the internet to see whether their favorite vehicles are still in existence. Most times you can get clues as to where they might be or where they might have ended up. In those days, it was so much more about um, having to buy a PSV Circle news sheet. Maybe they knew, maybe they didn't. Um, or a chance encounter. And speaking of chance encounters, it turned up a few weeks later at Tame Show. I mean, you just, you couldn't make it up. Um, it's now in France as a glamping pod. And um, I found it on Google Street View, if anybody wants to know. But uh, anyway, I'm going to the south of France next year, so I'll report back. Um, just before the break, some little distractions that crept in. You'll remember those vehicles that I thought were Bristol SUs. Um, it turns out they were. And in 1993, I launched a campaign for us to have one that was going to become available. We actually didn't have the one that became available. We had a different one because uh, this is an SU coach that is in its original unmodified form with its original coach blind. Um, the other one, like uh, all the other remaining ones, had been converted to dual purpose. So we ended up with the, the, pick, of the pick of the batch here, 275 KTA. Um, everything became about SUs, as you can see. I think that's my 12th birthday. And there we are um, going through the restoration process. It's all too familiar, this now. And the finished product there, us on a running day at Bampton in Devon. We got to the stage that I went to university and people had said to me, you'll lose interest at that point. You'll go on to other things. Um, it, it really didn't, um, it didn't happen, I'm pleased to say. Uh, in fact, it only grew stronger. These are my student digs on the right and this is how I moved in <laughs> and moved out. So this is, um, this is very much uh, where we got to in the early stages of adult life with buses at the, at the forefront. Um, I'm going to let you have a break and then we'll resume the story. We'll talk a little bit more about later fleet expansion that I've done. And then we'll go on to talk a little bit about um, this uh, grading project, which hopefully is going to give us all a, a, a big rosy future. Um, is it, it must be tea time, it I think. It is tea time. Definitely tea oh, time. Right, thank you very much. Yeah. Right, so we're going to turn the lights on. <laughs> <laughs>